what I'm going to talk about is, um, is very concretely a particular theatre production that explored um, consumer capitalism. From it. But at the same time, um, Paul and I are embarking on a, a, a new project in an embryo form at the moment. So we, we'll, we might talk about that a little bit as well, perhaps particularly in the, in the discussion session afterwards. But I wanted to talk about something very concrete in order to pattern out some thoughts that we might develop about theatre and capitalism. Um, but also the World Factory is the catalyst to the conversation uh, that's been evolving between Paul and I, uh, which he saw because he saw the show when he was uh, when it was on at the Young Vic last year. Um, so let me just So Hell Factory is a piece of interactive performance. It explores the sharp end of the production consumption cycle of consumer capitalism. And that's just a speeded up uh, indication of the audience entering uh, the space. As you can see, it's a kind of um, bespoke system that is uh, designed to be a cross between a factory floor uh, and the way that it's lit eventually a kind of a casino. The invitation is to audiences, perfectly ordinary theatre-going audiences, um, many of whom, um, at the Young Vic at any rate, uh, ha hadn't actually weren't aware at all that it was going to be a piece of interactive theatre and were just coming to the theatre to see a show, um, to come into the space and sit around these small uh, tables that you see here. The invitation was to, to imagine yourself as running a small Chinese clothing factory. The show has at its heart an interactive card game, which is a kind of scenario-based uh, game which has, in, term, uh, in terms of small nuggets of storyline that are structured to go in different di directions depending on what decisions you make. It's kind of like a cross between Monopoly and poker, uh, but with stories. Uh, so you have, a, you have money and you have workers, and the, so the different elements of, of what you have as a kind of apparatus. Uh, determines the way that you make decisions. And on the front of the card was a conundrum, a kind of question about how to run your factory, and on the back were two different ways in which you could respond, designed to produce a discussion amongst the audience members sitting around each table. So there are about six audience members per table. And the show itself is not only about China. I mean, we chose the idea, uh, we chose a Chinese clothing factory because, in fact, the project originated in Shanghai in a conversation I was having with a Chinese theatre director about communism, capitalism, clothing and factories. And he wasn't talking um, about contemporary China. He was talking about Manchester in the Industrial Revolution. And that immediately shifted my position as a, away from a kind of vaguely guilty consumer who wasn't quite sure whether she should shop in Primark or not, um, to a sense of myself as a historical subject, as, as a, a, a citizen of the country that de facto invented the factory system. So I became interested in these kind of global historical kind of um, cross-references. And the, and the term World Factory itself comes from a piece of tourist literature, in fact, about Manchester, but it's a term that is, is used in, in China to describe um, the, the situation of production there, which is obviously at the moment evolving and transitioning away from, from, from what it has been for, for the past sort of 20 years or so. Um, so I'm just going to show you a little bit of the way that the game part of the show starts. The Yijongka. 你们好，这是你们的第一张卡。嗯，好，那可能。If you're taking over a clothing factory, you have to cut the wage bill. Two options. Option one: keep the workers' wages at the current level, but sack half of your workers. Option two: keep all your workers and lower their wages by a third. They're already earning below the living wage in the UK. Oh, no, I think it's... Partner. Isn't it just below their living wage where they are? Yeah, I think it must be for where they are. No, actually, I'm not, I don't want to be a part of a company that, that doesn't try and do the best for the workers, because <laughs> uh, I'm less interested in profits. You're too much of a Bolshevik. I don't know what they like. Hey, I just want to treat these people fairly and make a bit of money. Do you want to have the... But I don't actually think lowering people's wages below the living amount... We don't know if amount. Amount. we'll get benefits. But it's already widespread. 
Yes, so, so is the minimum wage at the moment, but actually, I don't think people should work for it. Yeah, but then you're sacking them, they don't have a job at all. China's growing, they will find another job. Efficiency is life. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Shall we vote? I'm saying number one. Number one. <laughs> yeah? I'm going to go for number two. From a business point of view, I think one is probably... Okay, so I'm outnumbered. So it's, it's, it's pretty, should we scan number one? Yeah. Probably won't have enough work for now to... Yeah. <laughs> So, um, as you can see there, you get to uh, use a shop scanner to create a satisfying bleep when you finally make your decision. And the sort of bleeps would go around the room and everyone's like, oh, they've made their decision already, right? We better hurry up with ours. Um, and the game starts for each of, the, each of the tables who are a factory uh, with the same card, but it goes on multiple routes through what we call the kind of um, the, the, the world factory phenomenon. Uh, and we, may, we give game instructions at the beginning that say it's up to you what it means to win. Um, and the question of what it means to win under conditions of consumer capitalism is one that sort of, uh, was the sort of at the heart of the, of the show. But what this game structure allowed us to do, I think you probably saw in the video the way that there are lots and lots of cards. So there's 420 cards in total, which actually equates to, um, I think, more than five million different mathematical routes through the game. So we had a bespoke um, computer system which allowed us to jump people into different parts of the card structure depending on decisions that they, that they made. And that's without taking into account the actual conversations people were having, which obviously completely uh, germane to the people around the table um, and the amount of money or workers that they might have at any given time. But what it allowed us to do is create a system that touched on many different thematics, so environmental impacts, mm. labour conditions, um, child labour, the question of pollution, questions of migration, immigration, and globalisation. So in a way it was about producing a, a sort of the network of how these topics interrelate, like what the kinds of pressures are under which one of these small factories might be operating. And the whole... Uh, project was based on a really extensive research period, which was sort of iterative in the sense we were both trying to evolve what the appropriate form would be for, it, for representing this, this world, and at the same time trying to develop a palette of material that would enable us to tell the stories. So every single story in the game is based on something we either directly experienced ourselves, were told by a, a a worker or a factory manager in China, or by um, other experts. And in fact, what we did was we, uh, we went to China and had a shirt made in a Chinese factory as part of the process. Because having done lots of... <laughs> oh, which I believe somebody is wearing tonight in the audience here. <laughs> so this shirt, uh, as well as being highly wearable... <laughs> and, uh, you can buy it online, by the way. I'm, I'm <laughs> product placement here. <laughs> That's not deliberate. Um, um, was, uh, it's, it's no ordinary shirt, it has barcodes on it, which when you scan the barcode, it triggers a video on your smartphone um, that shows part of an aspect of the people or processes that went into the making of that very shirt. So there's a sort of sense we're trying to kind of collapse that, um, that distance that we have from the products that we wear. But it was also part of the research methodology that actually you can read about um, these questions and you can go from sort of uh, abstract economic theories down to interviews with workers and you still don't really fully understand what the pressures might be. But when you find yourself in a Chinese factory thinking, oh, we're a kind of socially liberal performing arts company, so we really shouldn't like try and knock the price down because that feels really awkward however they might not trust us if we don't because that's what you're supposed to do isn't it in these situations so you're in this sort of world where you're suddenly rubbing up against your own perceptions of your your ethical practices um so, the, so the, 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 the show didn't end at the end of the game because it became clear in, our, in, our, in the process of developing it that having put all that work into the labour of playing the game in the performance, that people wanted to have an understanding of, of what, where that had uh, taken them and what that might, what that might mean. Um, however, we didn't want to kind of lock down uh, a response to what they'd done because one of the things we didn't know was what the nature of the conversation had been in each, in the, on each table and they were extremely rich these conversations when we did record them and listen back um, and, and often took the ideas that were expressed in these very short pieces of text on the cards that were stories into, into whole other imaginative dimensions that, that we hadn't anticipated um, 
so what we developed was a kind of, we called it the reckoning, um, a kind of ambivalent, saturated game show format. Uh, the the uh, computer database had accumulated specific data about each route through the game as the audience had gone through it. And then we fed that back to them. Um, and I'm just going to show you a little bit. Choose. OK, so how many choices did we make together tonight? Let's take a look. In total, you have made 273 decisions, each one a step along a road. Now, so far in the World Factory, overall, not just tonight, we have seen two thirds of you choose to lower wages at this first fork in the road, which fascinatingly reflects the UK labour market at the moment, where we're seeing a stagnation in wages due to an increase in part time and temporary Thank contracts. You, Lucy. Rather than in total, you used 32,700 kilos of cotton, which in turn used. Yes, 654 million litres of water. Yep, that's right. Wow, those big numbers really are big. Zhichang assets. Okay, so your workers are your greatest asset. But how did you treat them? How did they fare? Factory J Jingwei. Factory J Jingwei. Jingwei chose to prioritize worker conditions the most. We're gonna have a little conversation later, us guys. We're friends now, right? Okay. So tell me, Heather, would you? Let's take a little look, shall we, at the uh, bottom of that graph. Factory A, Ai Man. Factory G, Gong Cheng. Factory M, Ming Sheng. Factory O, O Lai. Ah, A, G, O, and M's not even on the chart. Look at that. Really stitched your workers up there, didn't you, lads? See? Didn't give a fly. Thank you, Lucy. Jin <laughs> Xian. So, uh, so the show was not just a game. Uh, the aim was not to give people some kind of uh, naturalistic understanding of what it would be like to run a Chinese clothing factory, but rather to use the uh, global textile production system as a metaphor uh, for thinking about consumer capitalism in a, in, a, in a large picture. So we started the show with a kind of catwalk uh, quotation scenario kind of uh, element, which allowed us to sort of make a very, very high theatre gesture before kind of moving into the game and the more participatory elements, um, but also to kind of pin, attempt to pinpoint a, 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 a political origin to uh, this form of contemporary consumer capitalism uh, by quoting Reagan, Thatcher and Deng Xiaoping and their, and their political intentions from the kind of late 70s and, and early 80s. Um, but the other side of that was that what we didn't really want to do uh, was simply kind of make it more accessible or sort of this gamification um, idea that you make a, a theme more uh, available to an audience by, uh, by kind of making it tangible through it being bespoke, through it being kind of a consu you know, sort of consumer form of theatre in that sense. But instead it was actually a, a specific idea about the position from which we judge. So when you go to a traditional piece of theatre, the invitation is to judge the character morally, emotionally, socially for the actions that they take. What we wanted to do is to ex expose the conditions under which those decisions take place. And the way to do that was to ask the, pe ask the audience to make the decisions themselves. Because in that way, then, you, you invite people to pay attention to the conditions under which those decisions are made. So what we found is that you, you have a situation in which what you would judge of someone else as a kind of moral failure, when you're the one that's making the decision, it, you rationalise it as the only thing you could possibly do under those circumstances. And that's something, certainly, that... We we overheard audiences doing all the time in terms of the justifications for the kinds of actions that they plan to take in the, in the playing of the game. So it was about changing the position of the audience uh, and putting them right in the midst of these difficult uh, questions. And that, that's the, in that lay the utopian dimension of the show as well. 
in the sense that um, what we ended up finding ourselves painting was a pretty bleak picture of the contemporary state of play in terms of, of the way that the clothing industry currently operates. We weren't intending to do that strategically, but when you put all the stories together of what goes on and what effects they have, it becomes really difficult to behave ethically under those under those circumstances. Um, but, but at the same time, there were all these conversations going on in the show, and that's where we sort of felt that the, the, there was a kind of utopian gesture, which is a sort of idea borrowed from uh, the economist Harjun Chang of active economic citizenship. The, the message, if there was one at all, being that if these are the conditions in which we live, we should be talking about it and we should own it and, and be thinking about it together. And, and that's, that seemed to kind of really take off in terms of how the audience responded. And the kind of fascinating thing in relation to that, I've just uh, put these up um, simply to illustrate it, is that then it was reviewed from all corners of the press. Um, and had you had to kind of work out blindfold whether the review was from the right wing press or the left wing press, you'd have found it difficult to... Uh, tell the difference between them, except perhaps the Morning Star, which used the word superstructure, where that might have outed it, <laughs> political affiliations. But otherwise, um, interestingly, it tapped into di different themes of thinking across the political spectrum, which for us was a measure of the success of the, of the piece of work, because its intention wasn't to uh, lock down a particular response to capitalism and rather to invite a conversation about it, a conversation that needed to involve a lot of people from a lot of different kinds of backgrounds. But interestingly, you know, the, much of the laughter generated in the show uh, is, it's, is also the sort of tragedy of the system, which is it's from, arise from the, arose from the recognition that our, our sort of incredibly sophisticated capacities for conversations around morals and, and ethics um, often boils down to a decision that's entirely self-interested. So audiences were sort of navigating that gap continuously throughout um, the performance. Um, and uh, Paul talked about it in his article on, on the on World Factory, where he said that capitalism subjects us to economic rationality, and the show could be said to be a kind of manifest, you know, a clear manifestation of that in action. Even though it's in a kind of leisure sphere in which people are at play, there is nothing at stake. It's be taking part in the performance. Nevertheless, something about the the notion of winning the game starts to trump any any other um, consideration. Because people often said, we wanted to be ethical, but we thought we might go bankrupt. It's like, well, we had a plan for if people went bankrupt, because we thought that would be really fun if some of the factories went bankrupt, so we could do all these other things with them. But no one ever went bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> like, we did, I don't know how many shows we did, but like, maybe 30 or 40 shows, if, uh, in each one, 16 factories played the game. That's a lot of games altogether, and nobody, uh, nobody ever lost all their money. Um, so it's interesting because the data that we then accumulated, this is a map of how the cards all interrelated. And so different strands of this route uh, take you along what we sort of designated more ethical or more capitalist um, routes, although they sort of endlessly intersected as well, um, was that we discovered that, of course, the reasons that people weren't going down one route to another wasn't, obviously, it's a theatre performance, there's not one, a direct kind of relation um, <coughs> between people's political affiliations and what they do in the game, and that felt important as well as, as a way of, of um, thinking about it and enabling people to play against their own inclinations and, and so on. But that actually, the, the, the predominance of the... Um, of play went through the rather more profit-driven routes. Um, but that was also generated by this fear, by this notion of sort of prudence, that we need to survive, we're responsible for workers, we've got to make it work within the, within the framework that we've been given. Um, so this is where the conversation with Paul began. In the way the show opened up with this kind of series of questions about ethics, um, and, they, and it evolved into a discussion about human, about the representation of the human in general, and then uh, particularly about thinking about the emergence of capitalism. The idea being that um, what, what we're starting to do is tr attempt to create a structural economic analysis of Shakespeare's plays, of early modern dramas. So not just Shakespeare, but the, but the um, plays across that period. Um, as a site of representation of emerging capitalism. Not the way the characters talk about money and finance necessarily only, but also the way that they respond and interact with each other. So the question being, who are we as human subjects 
And this, but it's not a historicist uh, project as such. It's really about who we might be under the conditions of the future. So for me, it's like understanding the language of capitalism, capitalism and understanding the way it's suffused the way that we make theatre now and what we think of, for example, as a character. It came up this afternoon, we were having a conversation um, about, uh, about capacity, the capacity to act, uh, concepts of rationality and intentionality as well. Um, but you know, if we can work out, for me anyway, if we can work out what the frame of that is, we might be able to start to imagine what other kinds of people we might be moving beyond that. Thank you.